Hi, I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. We're happy to see you this Thursday, two days away from the long Labor Day weekend. Parts of the U.S. Southeast could be weathering a hurricane over that weekend. Yesterday, a storm named Dorian was spinning over the Atlantic, headed toward the U.S. Virgin Islands and eastern Puerto Rico. The silver lining is this system is not as strong as Hurricane Maria. That was a Category 4 storm that smashed into Puerto Rico in 2017. The bad news is Dorian could cause further damage on an island that's still recovering from Maria. There are still tarps on some of the roofs that Maria damaged. There are still weak spots in the electrical system that Maria knocked out. So Puerto Rico has declared a state of emergency, opening hundreds of shelters to residents and prepping 70 hospitals in case of injuries from Dorian. Forecasters have had their hands full trying to figure out where this storm's going to go. Just two days ago, they projected that it would roll south of Puerto Rico and barrel over the Dominican Republic. Last night, Dorian looked like it would miss that country altogether because it had turned northward, though heavy rain and tropical storm force winds were still possible. What happens after this is anyone's guess. Dorian was a Category 1 hurricane as of last night, and meteorologists think it'll strengthen further after it passes by the islands and gets back out over the Atlantic. Dorian already caused flooding in Martinique when it was a tropical storm. If it becomes a Category 3 hurricane, which some scientists expect, Dorian could have wind speeds of up to 115 miles per hour and be capable of serious damage. And the National Hurricane Center says it could then approach Florida or other parts of the American Southeast over the weekend. The forecasters still don't know if, where, or when that'll happen. One thing they do know is what to name storms. If you lived in Homestead, Florida in 1992, Andrew is a name you will never forget. Just like in 2005, if you lived in the New Orleans area, Katrina. The military started naming storms after their wives, their girlfriends, but none of these names were made public. So in 1950, everything changed. Several storms formed out in the Atlantic about the same time. It created a lot of confusion. So the U.S. Weather Bureau said, okay, let's start naming storms. And they actually started by using the World War II alphabet. Abel, Baker, Charlie, Dog, Easy. But this created confusion as well because every year the storm names were the same. It wasn't until 1979 that we started alternating male and female names. We recycle that list every six years. In the Atlantic Basin, we use English, Spanish, and French names. No storms are named after a particular person. In fact, you can't request a storm to be named after you. That entire process is handled by the World Meteorological Organization. A storm name will be retired if it is too costly or deadly and it would be inappropriate to use it in future years. In fact, since 1950, there have been nearly 80 storm names retired. And what happens if we go through all of the storm names? Well, it happened in 2005. We ended up going to the Greek alphabet. So that's what's in a name. It took a long time to get here, but just like each individual name, each storm tends to have its own personality. Trivia. Which of these places is known as the land of fire and ice? Mauna Kea, Iceland, Indonesia, or the Peruvian Andes? Because its features include both volcanoes and inland glaciers, Iceland is called the land of fire and ice. 
It's also one of the most popular countries in the world for adventure tourism or adventure travel, a type of trip that might include physical activity, interaction with other cultures, and spending time in nature. As an industry, it's growing, but it's not for everyone. Adventure tourists often get outside their comfort zone. For some, that's the goal. They may be taking part in dangerous hikes or activities, and they may be traveling through hostile areas. But adventure tourism can allow people to see firsthand something exotic that they wouldn't see back home. A 105-mile trail through Egypt is one example. Daybreak over the Red Sea Mountains. Guys, this is one of my favorite mountains. It's called Jebel Gatai. It kind of looks like flames rising up out of a fire. Until recently off the tourism path, these peaks are a familiar sight for British explorer Ben Hoffler, who five years ago set out to create the first long-distance trail in mainland Egypt. The Red Sea Mountains have always been a really key area for Egypt. Many civilizations came here and they made ways through these mountains from the pharaohs to the Ptolemies to the Romans. What we did with the Red Sea Mountain Trail was identify all of these old routes and put these together in a way that uh, creates a, a hiking route for modern times. The trail is one of two routes Ben has set up in the country. Joining him on this trip are the fellow hikers who back in 2015 worked with him to develop a similar trail in the Sinai Peninsula. Developing trails for tourism is something that is now a trend um, and it's growing very, very fast. But having people that have lived in this land for maybe hundreds of years adds another completely different aspect to this experience. Joining up an ancient network of trade, travel and hunting routes, the 170 kilometer long path crosses the land of the Maza. As one of Egypt's largest tribes, they were instrumental in the development of the trail. The trails, they're 100% owned by the Bedouin community, but in the process of creation, we walked together for thousands of kilometers. If the pyramids are a monument to the Egyptians, uh, a path, a trail, would be the best monument to the Bedouin as a traveling people. Uh, for me, there's no better way to show who the Bedouin are uh, than to walk a path with them. My stuff. This is for uh, allergy of the chest. Everything here really serves a purpose. When fully operational, the trail will take 10 days to complete. And by offering an authentic cultural immersion with the Maza, it will open up one of the least known areas and cultures of Egypt to a new type of adventure tourism. The beauty of it is that when you create a trail, this creates a microeconomy around the benefits to local people of that particular region. The path for me shows where they've come from. It shows who they are, how they've lived. Um, and perhaps this path, it can be part of the story of where they're going in the future too. Okay, what's fascinating about today's 10 out of 10 segment isn't so much what you're seeing, but where you're seeing it. These are innumerable pieces of pumice rock as recorded from a boat. What's being called a raft of floating pumice is the size of the New York City borough of Manhattan, and scientists believe it could be linked to the recent eruption of an underwater volcano in the South Pacific. Australian sailors say the rocks range from being the size of marbles to the size of basketballs, if the raft reaches Australia's Great Barrier Reef in the months ahead, it could bring new species there. It's the kind of scene to stun us, sailing stony seas of pumice, like a pebbled dock of floating rock that stretches out before us, waves of stone floating on sea foam, all because the glass is porous. It's volcanic, but don't panic, as the blasts beneath the surface that can help coral reef generate and serve a higher purpose than just giving us a sight to see a sea that rolls and shocks and makes waves for making waves, showing that nature truly rocks. I'm Carl Azus, and that's CNN 10.